And this is the frontal setup as a result of the law with the cooler air coming in. This the area of action on this law is tremendous. It includes a good part of the hall of... Morning. When I was uh, 12 years old, I uh, went uh, hiking in the high Sierras of the YMCA camp, spent a week hiking up there uh, every summer for my middle school years, and I carried a pack sort of like this. We, we called it a horseshoe pack. Kids in our neighborhoods uh, were less likely to be able to afford a, a real pack, so they recommended this homemade variety. And uh, this is what we carried through the mountains back then. It looks really comfortable, right? It included your ground cloth, which is wrapped around the outside of it, which also doubled as a tent if you needed it. Uh, a heavy sleeping bag, cloth sleeping bag, not like the light ones, light, lightweight ones you have now, but a heavy you know, cloth sleeping bag, a week's worth of clothing, your pillow, your toiletries, a metal dish, a f uh, fork and spoon. Then the counselors would divvy up the uh, shared equipment that you'd have to carry among the different campers as well. Things like pots and pans and lanterns and stoves. And then all our food was stuffed in our sleeping bags. That's a good idea. You would then strap these things with belts um, together and carry it around your, your shoulder. We'd spend a week hiking through these beautiful trails in the mountains, except you couldn't see a thing, except for, you know, the, the person in front of you. You saw nothing in the entire trip. One day, Jesus had some harsh words for the uh, religious leaders of his day. This is what he said to them. He said, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Jesus equated the religious leaders of the day, and especially their regulations, to these heavy loads that they would place on the backs of the individuals that were trying their best to please God. This pack that I'm wearing reminds me of what religion was like in Jesus' day. They called it a yoke. The yoke was their word for the law, the regulations that you would, you would um, place upon people. It was like the apparatus that they would put on the back of beasts of burden as they would plow the field. 613 laws, they counted each one in the Old Testament, and then they built what they called a hedge around those laws, other laws that would keep you from breaking the law in various situations. Law upon law, weight upon weight, burden upon burden. And they were quick to tell you if you're doing it wrong. And if you ever hope to please God whatsoever in that culture, you'd have to carry this huge burden. It was bulky. It was heavy. It was uncomfortable. It was burdensome. This is what religion was like in Jesus' day. And it wasn't just Jesus' day. It was every age since. And a lot of us, even here today, have grown up with that kind of view of religion. Maybe you still sort of see it that way, this heavy, oppressive, limiting, restrictive apparatus that you kind of carry around with you. Mostly don'ts in a list of do's and don'ts that are heavy to bear and cumbersome and burdensome. Even those with a genuine relationship with Jesus, I have found, so easily can fall back into that sort of religious mindset. We come to church and we hear a message on following Jesus and we say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to really, really try hard to be more like Jesus. That's going to be my goal this week. And then we come to church the following week and we hear a message on prayer and we go, okay, I'm going to get up early every morning and I'm going to pray. And then we hear a message on making a difference and, we, and you say, I'm going to volunteer in the community this week. And we hear a message about patience and we walk out thinking, tomorrow I'm going to really, really try hard to be more patient. And pretty soon the weight feels heavier and heavier and heavier. 
And suddenly being a Christian uh, becomes like the horse you pack. Or to change the analogy, like the luggage that um, I carried on my first trip overseas. Why did it take so long to invent wheels on luggage? Why was that so hard to put together? Where were those on our honeymoon, on all the luggage that I carried? So like a bulky horseshoe pack or heavy suitcase without wheels, religion can become such an oppressive burden. And it was into that world, a world that that was exactly the view of religion and that was reinforced all around them that Jesus stepped and he announced these words. He said, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Today we continue our series, 100% Chance of uh, using the unpredictability of weather forecasts, especially those forecasts that are longer than just a few days out. We are comparing the fickleness of this world to the certainty of Jesus' promises. What can we know beyond just a few days? I mean, the patterns are changing, the fronts are building, the winds are changing, the temperature is rising. What can we count on for sure? Turns out, there is nothing more certain in our unpredictable lives than when Jesus says, I will. Open with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 28. We're looking at those places in the the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus says, I will. And we're we're finding in those those statements these incredible life-changing promises that we can hold on to uh, in unpredictable times. But before we get to Jesus' promise, a forecast that you can count on 100%, let's begin with what, what sometimes makes it hard to believe these promises. It is sometimes hard to believe so many of Jesus' promises and experience so many of his promises, well, because because of the clouds that we see. Look at uh, Matthew 11, 28. It begins this way. Come to me, all you who are weary... And burdened. Jesus is very specific here. He addresses those who are weary and those who are burdened. The clouds we often are distracted by are the clouds of weariness and burdens. Weariness is the idea of of being exhausted from hard work, hard labor, and the word burdened here means to be weighed down as with heavy cargo. It's so easy for you and I, isn't it, to be tentative about the future, trepidatious about what's ahead, far from experiencing God's promise, because we're tired. We're worn out. We're worn down. We're we're burdened. We wonder as we look ahead, will I have enough? Will I be enough? Jesus is about to give a a 100% forecast But the clouds of weariness and the clouds of burdens sometimes get in the way. In many ways, the pandemic accentuated just how weary and burdened we were as a culture. Life significantly slowed down for a lot of people, not everyone, but for many people. And because of that, many people find themselves both eager to re-enter and at the same time hesitant to step back into the pace that we all used to keep even with church life. Because church life itself can be burdensome. Jumping through hoops, feeling the pressure, always comparing, not measuring up, seeing what they're doing, wondering if I should do the same. Even within the church, we can get weary and burdened. So to all who are weary and burdened, in whatever ways it shows itself, Jesus is about to give a 100% forecast. So let's read all of verse 28. He says this, Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. To those who are burdened, Jesus forecasts, I will refresh you. I say refresh because the word rest here means godly well-being. It has the idea of a spiritual recharge. It's, It's actually linked deeply to our salvation, the word of salvation, It resides in it. In verse 29, 
He calls it rest for your souls. So this is a deep soul rest. This is a spiritual rest. This is a a trickle charge at a very, very deep level in our inner life. Soul rest, spiritual refreshment. You might need sleep. You might need a break. You might need a day off. You might need a vacation. You might need a Sabbath. You might need a sabbatical. All of those could be part of God's Rx for you. But none of those things will solve your problem at the deepest level. Again, end of verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. At the heart of what Jesus offers here is soul rest, spiritual breathing room, godly refreshment. For those who are weary and burdened, Jesus forecasts this, I will refresh you. I will give you spiritual rest. And I love how broad this is. I I love this. Notice the word all here. Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. This invitation is so wide. It is so broad. It is so everyone. All means all. All. No matter what your faith outlook is, your your relationship with God, come to me all. Whether you live in the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, California or Vermont, whether you're a Buddhist or a Christian, a believer or an atheist, 19 or 99, all means all. Today we celebrate baptism. And and baptism at its core is a come-to-me-all event. It is this wide, broad promise that whoever would come to Jesus, they would find spiritual refreshment, rest in their very souls. What a promise. But as quickly as I say that, I need to add, many people do not take Jesus up on this offer. Not even believers. Not even us. In other words, it is very possible to be a believer who is weary and burdened, weighed down and overloaded, overwhelmed and exhausted, and still not experience the promised rest that Jesus offers. Why? Because according to this verse, if I'm reading it correctly, we have to come. It is not enough to simply know that Jesus makes his promise, to memorize it, to be familiar with it, to have heard it. We have to take him up on it. We have to come. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the process of how we access this promise. Let's talk about how to and not to experience spiritual rest. All we have to do is read the first, uh, the next, the first couple of verses of the next chapter. They're they're coupled together right after this. You know, in the in the Bible when it was first written, there weren't any chapter divisions or verse divisions. So this story that follows is meant to just come right after Jesus' invitation by design to show us the contrast between what Jesus offered and what they were experiencing. Matthew 12, verse verse 1 says this, At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. The Sabbath, of course, was the day of rest. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. All they were was hungry. All they were doing was picking some grain. But the religious leaders of the day were quick to make them feel sinful, guilty, and unspiritual. True, the Old Testament prohibited working on the Sabbath, but nothing was wrong with picking food to eat. Nevertheless, the Pharisees had taught that it was even wrong to to pluck a bit of grain and rub it in one's hands before eating. According to their teaching, suddenly you were farming. Suddenly you you were working. Burden, burden, weight, weight. Ironically, The Sabbath, which means rest, was turned into a day full of rigor and regulation. Anything but restful. So let's get back to what Jesus said. 
And notice that everything he says in this invitation is meant to directly confront the kind of legalism, heavy-handed, overburdened approach to religion that all his disciples had grown up in, and the people that he spoke to had the very same experience. In verse 29, Jesus actually uses the language of the Pharisees to make his point. In verse 29, he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. As I said, the Pharisees had called their rules their yoke, the yoke that they would put upon others, like the harsh equipment used to uh, subject oxen to keep them in line. The religious leaders put a yoke on their followers. So, So don't miss this. Jesus intentionally uses their language when he says, take my yoke upon you. And then he adds in verse 30, For my yoke is easy. Now that's exactly the opposite of their experience with the yokes of religion they knew. So let me fill uh, fill out the chart for you and your outlines to kind of show the contrast here. If you would like to remain restless in your religion, then see God's expectations on you as hard, as hard. And that's pretty typical uh, to see religion that way, even today. That God's expectations on us are hard and and rigorous. Jesus said his yoke was easy, but if you want to be restless, see God's expectations as hard. Like a horseshoe pack or a giant set of luggage without any wheels. But, If you want to experience Jesus' promise, if you want to experience a restful faith, see God's expectations as well-fitted, well-fitted. I'll explain why I'm using that term in a moment. It is in a direct contrast to the binding yoke that the Pharisees were offering. Jesus offers them a yoke that fits. In fact, it turns out the word easy can be translated well-fitted or well-suited. For example, the message translates verse 29 this way. It says, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. God's expectations for your life are well-suited. They're well-fitted to you. They may not be easy per se. I'll give you that. But they are perfectly suited for the life that he's called you for to. They don't bind. There's even a comfort to them because they're designed for the way we live and and the the way he's put us together. They fit. We need to to see that that God's expectations upon our life are meant to to fit for, for the life that we have. They're designed for us. He, the one that put us together, also put together the the expectations around us that would that would benefit us, that are suited for our lives. They're not they're not meant to make things hard for us. They're they're meant to make things better for us. If you want to experience Jesus' forecasted rest, then see God's expectations as well fitted for you. That's what Jesus meant when he said his yoke was easy. Next, if you want to remain restless in your religion, well, then see Jesus as demanding, like the Pharisees were on the Sabbath. See him as demanding, always expecting more and more and more, and and never being satisfied with what you do, always there to kind of catch you doing something wrong and pointing out how, how you've blown it. But if you want to experience a restful faith, look at verse 29 again. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Rather than viewing Jesus as demanding like the Pharisees, Jesus wants you to see him as gentle and humble. That's the way he describes himself. I am gentle and humble in heart. Unlike the harsh religious leaders who who demand the impossible and then won't help you get there, Jesus is approachable. He's, a, he's a, a gentle leader. Author uh, Dane Ortland has written a whole book on Jesus' phrase, I am gentle and humble in heart, and he writes this. He's a, he says, the point is that Jesus is accessible. 
For all his resplendent glory and dazzling holiness, his supreme uniqueness and otherness, no one in human history has ever been more approachable than Jesus Christ. To be gentle and humble, then, is to be approachable. A God who we can can come to and he's ready to receive us. It also carries the idea of being considerate. He says gentle and humble in heart. It's the idea that he considers our situation. He considers our lot. He considers our situation and, and, and the things that we face. What a fresh view of who Jesus is. Gentle, humble, considerate. So let me put it this way. If you want to experience, experience a restful faith, see Jesus himself as understanding. Understanding. As a gentle, humble, considerate leader, he understands you. He understands where you are and what you need and, and what you need to grow. And he gently leads you there. He considers your, your, your needs, your weakness, your, your circumstances, your past and your future, your, your, your environment. He knows your struggles. He knows the pace that you can handle. All of that is considered when you think of Jesus and, and his gentle leadership in our lives. Who wouldn't want to follow that kind of leader? One who says, I am gentle and humble in heart. Now look at the, the, the last phrase of verse 30. It says this, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says the burden that he placed upon his disciples was light. But that, that, that wasn't the experience of his disciples with religion up until that point. So finally, if you want to remain restless in your religion, view your spiritual duty as heavy, as heavy, weighty, restrictive, burdensome. Again, horseshoe pack-like. But if you want to experience a, a restful faith, remember what Jesus said, my burden is light. And, and the word light there carries the idea of liberating. The message translates this verse this way. It says, keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Rather than viewing your spiritual duty as heavy and burdensome, Jesus wants you to see the duty that he places on you as liberating, as you setting you free. Not heavy, but heavenly. Not not binding, but liberating. That's why James can call God's law the perfect law that gives freedom. When we think of all that Jesus demands of us, what he expects of us, who he is, and the duty that he calls us to to follow, it is meant to set us free. Sin itself, and even religion misunderstood, can, can bind us, it can shackle us, it can imprison us. But Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He came to liberate us. And and even his duty that he he calls us to is meant to be freeing. It's such a different way to view our faith. It's easy for us to feel um, that the spiritual life is hard, demanding, and heavy. And and when we do, we, we get burdened and we get weary. But Jesus invites us to see his approach to us as well fitted as understanding and is liberating. And if we do, then we have a 100% chance of finding rest. He will fulfill his promise. He will give us rest, rest for our souls, rest at the deepest level. What a different way to view our walk with Jesus. What a liberating way, what a freeing way. How different it is from the way our culture, and it's always been the case, the way the world views religion. So I'm going to leave here uh, and hopefully feeling different about my walk with God. I'm going to hope you and I both will be that way. We'll leave here with a, with a fresh view of, of what it means to follow him, this, this journey that he's invited us to. Where did I put my burden again? Oh, yeah, here we go.
There we go. That's better. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much for uh, unloading us, for taking the burdens that religion and this world and even just the demands of life place upon us and lifting those from us, for shouldering that with us and, and for uh, giving us in exchange, a, a yoke that you called easy and a burden that you said was light. Lord, we pray that as we um, go from this place, uh, that, that we, would, we would see you as our, our, our gentle and humble leader and uh, that it would change the way we think about what it means to, to walk with you and to move forward in our life with you. Uh, Lord, would you carry us? Would you lead us? Would you guide us? Thank you for knowing us so well. And I pray that you would uh, make this real for the lives of the people gathered here. Lord, we thank you, too, for, for uh, the, the privilege of giving to you and, and living for you and, and even giving our offerings and gifts to you. Would you use these gifts uh, for, your, for your purposes in, our, in this place and beyond? In Jesus' name, amen.